These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos by making a monthly pledge at my Patreon page. Or you can make a one-time payment by using the PayPal donate button on my website. Thank you. Uh, what type of molecule is this? This is protein? Yeah, it's a protein. Now, I want to go over uh, two different topics. Two different terms. Amino acid sequence and amino acid composition. What is the sequence? What's the amino acid sequence of this peptide? Uh, well, the sequence just is the primary structure. The sequence just is the primary structure. So the sequence is just what we already had written down. Which terminus is the phenylalanine? The phenylalanine is the uh, N terminus. Uh, and who's the C terminus? Alanine. How do you know? Well, we just have memorized that the convention is that sequence is written from N terminus to C terminus. Now, the composition, so the amino acid sequence shows the amino acids in the correct order. Sequence means the correct amino acids in the right order. Composition just means the correct amino acids, but you don't know the order. Composition shows the amino acids, but does not show the order. Does not indicate the order of the residues in the peptide. So what's the composition here? Well, the composition here would be Okay, did I get that right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay. Okay. Um, so do you see the difference between composition and sequence? Would you agree there's many different ways to write the composition, but there's only one way to write the sequence? Correct. Because notice, if you're writing the composition, these can be written in any order because they're not telling you the correct order anyway. So, these, so do these two have the same composition or different compositions? Different compositions. Why do you say they're different compositions? I know they're the same. They're made up of the same thing, but just in different order. Yeah. Now the or, the point here is that order is just meaningless. The order is just meaningless here. So the point is these are both two different ways of showing the same composition. Um, now a couple of conventions here. Notice that sequence is drawn with dashes, whereas composition. is drawn in parentheses with commas. These are just conventions that chemists have come up with. When you're drawing the sequence, when you know the correct order, you do that with dashes. And when you don't know the order and you're just writing down the amino acid composition, 
you write that in parentheses with commas. That way people know that you're not saying what the order is. Okay. Notice that usually when there's more than one amino acid in a composition, it's usually written with a subscript. What does this ala sub 3 mean? Why do you think I used this notation here? But my question was, uh, what does this ala sub 3 mean? Why, why that, did I write that down? That um, the supposed to be the third part of the sequence? No, I, I guess you're not quite, I guess that, that, that it didn't quite become clear. The point I was trying to make is, do you agree this is the composition for this peptide? I was trying to write down the composition of this particular peptide. Yes. So why did I write uh, ala sub 3? There are three alanines in that. Yeah. Uh, why did I write lyse sub 2? There are two alanines in the whole thing. Two lysines. Two lysines, right. Two, yeah, two lysines in the entire okay. peptide chain. So I'm just pointing out that when you write composition, that's often written with subscripts, just to save space when an amino acid appears more than once. Do you agree it wouldn't make any sense to use a subscript for the amino acid sequence? Because here we have to show each amino acid separately so we can get the right order. But for composition, you'll oftentimes see these types of subscripts. Okay. Um, so one thing that chemists really want to be able to do is they want to be able to take a peptide and figure out what its amino acid sequence is. Chemists want to be able to take a peptide and figure out its amino acid sequence. What's this? An amino acid sequence or an amino acid composition? Composition. How can you tell? Because it's you, there, there's um, commas and parentheses. That's right. Is this an amino acid sequence or composition? Sequence. How can you tell? Because there are no parentheses and there are dashed lines. What's the difference between what's the difference between the sequence and the what's the difference between the information you get from the composition and the information you get from the sequence? The sequence provides no parentheses and dashed lines, so it what I was going for is what's the difference in the information, not the, the notation. The amino acid, acid sequence is the correct order in the amino acid chain. Yeah, the composition doesn't tell you the correct order. Okay. Okay, so I was saying that chemists really would like to be able to take a peptide and figure out what its amino acid sequence is. Usually in your textbook, you see all these uh, little pictures, or the textbook often just sit, has all these sequences in them. But of course, when you're looking at, a, when you have a, a protein sample in a beaker or a test tube, you can't actually see. You can't actually see the amino acids. Uh, and I think even with microscopes, it's difficult or impossible to see the actual amino acids in the sequence. The amino acids in the sequence cannot actually be visualized. Uh, usually, I think even with a microscope, it's just too small. So, or at least, uh, I don't know, nowadays, nowadays, I don't know whether there's a way to do that, but certainly historically, there's no way to visualize them. Um, so how, how, do, how do chemists know what the sequences are? Well, that's one of the main things it looks like your instructor might put on the next test, the techniques for sequencing peptides. And those are the types of protein sequencing problems uh, that you were sending me. Uh, so for example, so what are the techniques that are used here? Well, one technique is that if you take a peptide, you can use the technique of hydrolysis and that will split the peptide up into amino acids. And then the amino acids can be identified. There are methods for identifying the amino acids. We might talk about those later. 
For example, you might use some type of column chromatography method to, uh, to identify what types of amino acids uh, you're dealing with. So if we can just split the peptide up into separate amino acids, we can use chromatography methods to identify what the amino acids are. Uh, so the technique that's used for splitting up a peptide into amino acids, it's just called a reaction called hydrolysis. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about hydrolysis in organic chemistry class. Basically, hydrolysis means breaking a large molecule into small molecules. The general definition of hydrolysis is when you take water plus a large molecule, water plus a large molecule, you can use hydrolysis and you split it up into two or more smaller molecules. I think we'll be seeing that term hydrolysis a lot in the course. This is the general definition of hydrolysis. Do you know what lysis means? To break. So why is this a logical name for this type of reaction? Because it's breaking the amino acids in the peptide chain. It's breaking apart the amino acids, yes. Why is it called hydrolysis? It's using water. Yeah, using water to break those. What type of bonds does hydrolysis break? Hydrogen bonds? No. Try it again. So try, try to think about that a little bit more carefully. Disulfide bonds? No. no take, take your time and try to actually think about what's going on here. Uh, oh, I'm, excuse me. I should have talked about this type of hydrolysis in particular. I, I wasn't clear. Remember, now we're going to study a particular type of hydrolysis where we're hydrolyzing a peptide into separate amino acids. So what particular bonds would this type of hydrolysis have to break to break the peptide into separate amino acids? Say again? Um, what particular bonds would hydrolysis have to break to break a peptide into separate amino acids? Covalent bond. What particular covalent bonds? Disulfide bonds? No. T take your time and try to try to visualize it and think about it. Remember what what happens when when we when we hydrolyze oh. a peptide? We're, peptide bonds. Yeah, that's right. Because what's holding the amino acids together? Peptide bonds. That's right. So if you're breaking a peptide into separate amino acids, you must be hydrolyzing, breaking the peptide bonds. So hydrolysis is a type of a reaction that specifically is good for attacking those peptide bonds. Uh, there's many other types of hydrolysis of other large molecules, but for a protein, we're using it to hydrolyze the peptide bonds. Okay. So, let's say a chemist performed hydrolysis on this peptide. If a chemist performs hydrolysis on this peptide, what results would they get? What would they learn? What could a, a, a chemist uh, learn from doing this hydrolysis? So, so what would happen? If you did this hydrolysis, what would be the product or products? If you did this hydrolysis, you would um, get two or, sm or more smaller molecules. That's the general definition, but I'd like you to apply that to this particular molecule. What would we get in particular if we did hydrolysis on this particular peptide? Complete hydrolysis, total hydrolysis. Individual amino acids? Yeah. Can you be more specific? What exactly would we get? Free valine, free leucine, free serine, free phenylalanine, and free serine. For a free serine subscript too. That's right. That is, you would get twice as much serine as the other amino acids. And remember, the chemists can identify all of these amino acids using column chromatography. All of these can be identified using chromatography. So after doing the hydrolysis, what would the chemists know? Would the chemists know the sequence of the peptide, or would they know the composition of the peptide? The composition. Do you see, hydrolysis can't tell you the sequence because after you do the hydrolysis, the amino acids are all jumbled up. Uh, in fact, the way I wrote it here is kind of misleading because I kept the same sequence. So I'll write it and say uh, 
I'll jumble them up some more. So that after doing this hydrolysis and doing the chromatography, the chemist will know that they got leucine, valine, phenylalanine, and twice as much serine, two equivalents of serine. So they'll know that the original peptide was composed of uh, two equivalents, serine, leucine, valine, and phenylalanine. So we're assuming that they knew from the start that there were five amino acids. Uh, they, they could, uh, there's techniques for judging the molecular weight ahead of time, so they could already be guessing that there's five amino acids. So supposing they already knew that there was five amino acids, uh, then they would know that this was the, uh, they would know this composition, but they would not know, they would not know uh, the sequence, but at least that's one clue. So we can use hydrolysis. So does, uh, can we use hydrolysis to figure out amino acid sequence or composition? Amino acid composition. But that might be one clue that helps us eventually to figure out sequence. Okay. By the way, uh, as a digression, what do you think a dipeptide is? Um, it's a polypeptide with two peptide uh, residues. Two what? Two peptide residues. Except they're called amino acid residues. The peptide mm -hmm. is the entire molecule. What's a tripeptide? Three amino acid residues. What do you think you call it with four residues? Um, um, I don't know. I, so for the C, uh, prefix is tetra. Tetra, okay. Do you know what a good prefix for five would be? How about five residues? I don't know. That would be a pentapeptide. You've heard of the Pentagon in Washington? Yeah. You know why it's called the Pentagon? It's five sides. That's right. Uh, what's a hexapeptide? Six residues. All right, that might not be obvious, but hexa is a prefix for six. Hepta means seven. about eight? Octopeptide. Okay, that might be as far as we need to go. So those are terms you might see on these types of problems as a digression. You have that down? Yes. All right. So what exactly would a chemist know after doing this hydrolysis? What would be the product of this hydrolysis? Decomposition of the uh, polypeptide. Yes. Can you be more specific? What would that be? Uh, histidine. Cysteine. Cysteine. Methionine, histidine, or well, I have histidine subscript two. Cysteine, methionine, and arginine. So the chemist would say, well, I don't know what the right order is, but I know these were the amino acids in the sequence. Okay, so we've learned our first technique, our first technique for determining uh, amino acid sequence for doing protein sequencing. The first thing is that you can at least find the composition of the amino acids. But we can see that that's not going to solve the problem because that doesn't tell us the order. So we're going to need some more techniques. Uh, so let's see. Another technique suppose that you have, we use a, pro, uh, a reagent called dancel chloride. Can we use some organic? Pardon me? Was this ever used in organic chemistry? Dancel chloride? Yeah. Uh, it is covered in some organic chemistry courses. 
Um, I, if I'm remembering right, I don't think your course did much protein sequencing. Maybe I'm just forgetting. But I thought your course didn't really get into protein sequencing. Am I, am I not remembering that correctly? So we might have covered it. So some organic chemistry courses do cover protein sequencing. Some organic chemists cover this. Or you might have briefly seen it in some other part. So it's possible. I don't particularly remember it, but it's certainly possible that we might have seen it. It sometimes comes up in OCHEM. In any case, uh, we'll go into it in more detail now. So how does dancel chloride work? Well, what happens when you combine dancel chloride with a peptide. What happens is that the dancel chloride attaches to the N terminus. like so. So just to keep things simple, I drew this as a tetrapeptide, but obviously it could be longer. So dancel chloride attaches to the N terminus. What do you think this each of these boxes represents? A polypeptide, uh, amino acid? Yeah, one amino acid residue. And the left side is the N terminus. Now what will happen then if we take this labeled peptide, and we can call these, uh, what happens if we take this and we do hydrolysis on it? Well, do you remember what bonds does hydrolysis break in a peptide? Peptide bonds. So what would we get? Well, we would get these separate amino acids now, but the hydrolysis does not break the bond to the dancel chloride. So notice how one of the residues is still attached to the dancel chloride even after hydrolysis. Even after hydrolysis, one of these will be still attached to the dancel chloride. And the chemist, there's ways of figuring out which one it is, again, I think using column chromatography. Um, by using column chromatography, you can, uh, you can detect when an amino acid has a dancel chloride uh, attached to it. So the point is the dancel chloride labels who used to be at the end terminus. The dancel chloride is a way of labeling the end terminus so you can figure out which amino acid was at the end terminus. Dancel chloride is a way of labeling the end terminus so you can figure out which amino acid was at the end terminus. So the way this is used is again, first you label the peptide with dancel chloride, then you use hydrolysis to break apart the amino acids. Tell me when you have that down. Okay. So what will happen if we add dancel chloride to this peptide? What will be the product? Uh, 
um, tensochloride is attached to isoleucine. And then the amino acid sequence continues from there. That's a good answer. And then what will happen when we do hydrolysis? The amino acids are broken apart individually but the benzoyl chloride is still attached to isoleucine. Now, when the chemist examines these results, what will they be able to figure out about the pentapeptide? They can figure out which one is the N-terminus, which amino acid is the N-terminus. Which one is? The isoleucine. So, on their piece of paper, they could write this down. And they could say, I'm 20% of the way to solving the structure. I figured out the first amino acid in the structure. Remember, they don't know this is the true structure. I wrote down this structure to make the example clearer, but the chemist in the lab doesn't know this is the structure. All they know is that when they did this experiment, they got these products. And from these, they can figure out that the N-terminus was isoleucine. So now we're starting to make progress on protein sequencing problems. This is a technique you can use to start trying to guess the sequence of the protein. Um, and then, what would the chemist say about these spots? Who goes here? Well, they would know that in these spots we have valine, threonine, alanine, and methionine, but they don't know in what order. So I'm gonna start trying to write down notation that I think is useful for protein sequencing. So here's an important notation. On these types of problems, you're generally gonna to be told how many residues there are. You're generally gonna to be told how many residues there are. So you should always start by making dashes for each residue. Start by making dashes for each residue. Anytime you figure out who goes, uh, who goes in a position, you should write that above the dash. And anytime you know who goes in a set of dashes, but you don't know the right order, I suggest writing those below the dashes. So those are the notation I would suggest. If you know exactly who goes in a dash, write it on the dash. If you know who goes in a set of dashes, but you don't know the right order, you should write those below the dash. Those are notations that are helpful for solving this type of problem. Okay, so let's try this problem. You can try this on your screen if you like.
Okay. So were you able to figure out the sequence? Yes. All right, congratulations. You're a protein sequencing chemist now. Very good. All right, so we figured out our first entire peptide sequence. Uh, that's how the chemists do it. We're right on, on track for a Nobel Prize. All right, well, some of the problems get a little bit more difficult than this, but we have to start somewhere. Uh, so now you can start to see how this dancel chloride technique is useful, because if we didn't use the dancel chloride, we wouldn't know who goes first. Uh, so in this particular case, since it was a very small, just a dipeptide, uh, you were successfully able to determine the entire sequence. So very good. Uh, and I uh, used good notation for that as well. It was an easy problem, but you used some good notation uh, for that. Very good. Uh, let's go back to my screen. Let me show you uh, how I would notate this. You, you basically did this correct. One thing I would do is, uh, from the very start, I would tell myself that I have this dipeptide, you did this. Also, um, I would write down that I know that the composition is serine and alanine. I'd write that up here. Um, and then, uh, then you can pretty much go to straight to the answer here. We know that alanine comes first and serine second. Oh, here's what I would actually do. Here's one thing. Here's very important. As soon as you know where one of the amino acids goes, cross it off of your list. As soon as you know exactly where an amino acid goes, cross it off of your list. And now you can see, how do you know that this is serine? Because it's the only thing left. Well, pre this is pretty obvious in this case, but it's helpful to cross things off your list when you know they're done. Okay, this is pretty close to what you did, but I just wanted to talk about this crossing it off technique. That can often be helped. All right, very good. All right, well, it looks like we, uh, we understood how to do that. So let's move on and to some harder questions. Oh, something I should say here is, um, looking at your instructor's problems, they actually don't usually mention the hydrolysis. Your instructor usually, in the problems that they gave you, don't. sometimes they mention hydrolysis, but oftentimes they don't mention the hydrolysis, especially if they use dancel chloride. So your instructor would probably write this like this. If you see what I'm saying, this is how your instructor usually writes it. So it's assumed that hydrolysis occurred? That's right. Well, you know, yeah. Actually, you know hydrolysis occurred because otherwise you wouldn't notice that it, it's implied by the yield. It said it yielded serine and separately dancel alanine. If you didn't do hydrolysis, you wouldn't have separate amino acids, right? They would be connected. So you can, it's pretty much implied by the way it's written that the hydrolysis happened. So you, you might have to use some judgment. But yeah, generally speaking, you should generally, it looks like, assume that after dancel chloride, we're doing hydrolysis. It looks like your instructor just generally assumes that after the dancel chloride, they're doing hydrolysis. But you can check that by making sure that it makes sense from the yield. Since the yield was separate amino acids, we know they must have done hydrolysis. You still need to know the term hydrolysis because your instructor does use that sometimes, but oftentimes they leave it out after the dancel chloride. Uh, you can tell. So basically, sometimes the instructor doesn't mention the hydrolysis, but you can assume it happened if you know that it yielded separate amino acids. Okay. Okay, uh, now what I've written down here is means the same exact thing as what I had before, basically, but this is how your instructor tends to write the problem, so this is a better way to, to do it. So let's try this again, and you can try this on your screen. For the part A, shouldn't there be a Danzel somewhere? No. So what they're describing here is that the chemist did two separate experiments. Mm -hmm. In the first experiment, they just did regular hydrolysis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then in the second experiment, they went back to the original tripeptide and did a different experiment. This time, they applied Danzel chloride. And even though it doesn't say so, after the Danzel chloride, then they did hydrolysis again. Your instructor doesn't usually mention the hydrolysis after using dancel chloride, but that's implied because otherwise you wouldn't get a separate amino acid. 
Does that make any sense? Yes. Okay. 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 So can we figure out who goes in the first position? Yes. Who is the first amino acid? Danzoproline. Okay, good. Except we're trying to figure out the original tripeptide. Who was the who was the first who was the N terminus in the original tripeptide? Proline. Not danzoproline. Oh. Remember the danzol is just something we added as a trick to try to figure out who went first. But right. we're trying to figure out what the original peptide looked before we added the dancel. All right, so who was the who was the first amino acid? Proline. Can we figure out who's in the second position? No. But who could it be? Either valine or histidine. Right. Can we figure out who goes in the third position? Either valine or histidine. But we don't know exactly. Okay, so it's important to know what you don't know. It's important to know what you don't know. Uh, we don't have enough information here to go any further. We were only able to get uh, part of the answer here. So that's good that you knew when to stop. Okay, you, you, did, you had a good approach there. Um, I'm just going to show you what I think is slightly better notation for this type of problem as they get harder. So first of all, for part A, what I would do for part A is I would say, oh, from part A, I know that the amino acids are valine, histidine, and proline. I would write them all out. And I guess I would also write that I know there's three peptides. Then from part B, I would say, aha, from part B, I know that the first position is proline. And now I know, then I would cross off the proline here, and I know that what goes here are valine and histidine, but I don't know in what order. This is pretty similar to what you did, uh, but notice there's no point still writing the proline down below anymore. There's no point. So one thing you didn't do is get rid of the proline down below. This will become more important when we're doing larger problems. As soon as you know where somebody goes, you need to cross it off from other positions. So in your answer, you still had a proline written down below as well. But you can erase or cross that out now because we know that these are the two in this position. So this is pretty close to what you did. Um, this is maybe a little bit slightly better notation. Okay, well, it looks like we've kind of hit a brick wall because it looks like if there's more than three residues, the dancel chloride is not going to give us a complete answer yet. So we need to move on and learn about another technique. Um, so I think we're done with the dancel chloride, and we need to go on to the next technique. So the next technique um, are enzymes that cut peptides. I think they're called proteolytic enzymes. So the next technique is proteolytic enzymes, enzymes that cut peptides. Um, so, uh, for example, we have uh, trypsin. Trypsin uh, cleaves the peptide after arginine and lysine. By the way, what do arginine and lysine have in common? Uh, 
Um, arginine and lysine are, they both have positive charges. Yeah, remember they're the only peptides that are fully positively charged at physiological pH, so it's not surprising that the enzyme treats them both similarly. Tell me when you have that down. Okay. So what would happen if we treat this peptide with trypsin? Well, I'll get you started. Uh, the trypsin, is the trypsin going to cleave this bond? No, because it only cleaves after arginine and lysine. Is the trypsin going to cleave this bond? No, because it only cleaves after arginine and lysine. Is the trypsin going to cleave this bond? Yes, because this is the bond after the arginine. So. this will get cut into a tripeptide. Then we'll get cysteine and arginine, and then this bond will be cut. Because we're cleaving after every arginine and lysine. So we'll also get this dipeptide. Does that make sense so far? Uh, do you understand how I got these two fragments? Yes. So what do you think would be the next fragment? Arginine alone? That's right, just arginine alone. Then what? Then leucine to lysine. So leucine, serine, threonine, lysine, a tetrapeptide. Good. Then what? Then tyrosine and glycine. Okay, so hopefully now you understand what we meant when we said that trypsin cleaves after arginine and lysine. When, uh, when we say after, that only works if you're writing it from the N-terminus to the C-terminus. After is in terms of writing it from the N-terminus to the C-terminus. Okay. All right, very good. So this is called a proteolytic enzyme because it's breaking a protein into pieces. Do you see how this is different than hydrolysis? Uh, how is this different than total hydrolysis? Total hydrolysis would break all the peptide bonds. Or in general, hydrolysis has the potential to break any peptide bond. Hydrolysis can break all the peptide bonds. But this enzyme, trypsin, can only break certain peptide bonds. Okay. What type of molecule is this? Tripeptide. Okay. It's a protein. Yeah. Very, very small protein or a tripeptide. What type of molecule is this? It's amino acid. Excellent. What type of molecule is this? Trypsin. Um... Is it an enzyme? That's right. How do you know? Uh, because I mentioned that uh, earlier today. So we mentioned, after all, that, that's the whole point. It's an enzyme that catalyzes this reaction. By the way, do you remember we said, what suffix do enzymes usually end with? Ace. But do they all end in ace? No. <laughs> you can see they don't all end in ace. Uh, this one doesn't end in ace, but it's still an enzyme. So which of the four types of biological molecules is this? 
an enzyme or a protein. Because enzymes are proteins. Okay, good. Uh, all right, so then normally now what the chemist would do next is hydrolysis. Ah, excuse me. What they could do next is, next they will separate these peptides. Each of these, so there's techniques that can be used, maybe column chromatography again. Um, there's techniques that can be used to separate all of these into separate beakers, separate flasks, and then we can do hydrolysis separately on each of those. Here's a hydrolysis. Here's a hydrolysis. These are all now happening in separate flasks. How did hydrolysis occur? Well, remember, you add water to break the bonds. Uh, to be more specific, you add acid and water. Uh, so hydrolysis involves acid plus water. It also usually involves high heat and long time. If you want total acid hydrolysis, you normally add uh, acid, water, um, high temperature, and you wait a long time to make sure all the peptide bonds are broken. Okay, so these are all happening in different flasks. And then what would be the results of hydrolyzing this peptide? You get uh, proline, comma, histidine, comma, arginine. I'm going to write it like this, though, because you wouldn't know the order anymore. And then what would be the results over here? Uh, cysteine, cysteine, comma, arginine. And here. Just arginine? Yeah, if you knew it was only in one amino acid, you probably wouldn't bother hydrolyzing it in the first place. Uh, and what would you get here? Uh, leucine, comma, serine, comma, threonine, comma, lysine. Right, I'm going to write them in a different order because you wouldn't know what the order was anymore. And how about here? Uh, tyrosine, comma, glycine. Good. So what what can the chemist figure out from this? Does the chemist know what the sequence is from this? No. No. But he does know that the proline, arginine, and histidine are next to each other in the sequence. He knows cysteine and arginine are next to each other in the sequence. They know that serine, leucine, threonine, and lysine are next to each other in the sequence. They know that glycine and tyrosine are next to each other in the sequence. So they have some clues, even though they don't know the whole sequence from this. This gives us some clues. Um, would they know that this fragment goes before this fragment in the sequence? No. There's no way to know that, no. They know that these were the fragments. This is a little bit misleading how they, the way I wrote this. They wouldn't know that the proline, arginine, histidine sequence fragment goes first. They'd have no idea what the order of these fragments is. They just know what the fragments are. So this is just a clue that we can use to try to figure things out. Um, I want to point out something that's very interesting, uh, though, here. Notice that every single fragment here, do you notice that all the fragments end in arginine or lysine? Yeah. Why is that? Uh, is it because of the positive charge? Because it all trips and cuts. Arginine is and lysine is and So cuts. notice it would be impossible to get a fragment that doesn't have an arginine or a lysine, right? Let me, let's actually look down here. Do you see that all of these fragments have an arginine or a lysine in them? Yes. And why is that? Because trypsin cuts where arginine or lysine is. So notice you couldn't get a fragment that didn't have an arginine or a lysine because the trypsin wouldn't cut, if you see what I'm saying? Yes. Well, I lied. Actually, there is one fragment that doesn't have an arginine or a lysine. The last one. Do you see how it's possible to get this one? Because when you cut here, this last fragment doesn't have to have an arginine or a lysine in it, does it? Yes. So that's very interesting about trypsin. So what have we just learned about, uh, we've just learned about trypsin. What does it mean if a fragment from trypsin does not have arginine or lysine in it? What, is, what do you know? 
it's the last piece of the polypeptide chain. So it sounds like I was giving up too soon, right? We actually do know something. This is, uh, this is kind of long. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So what can I write in here? What should I write? Well, I know that this, I can write this. Do I know exactly goes, who goes here? No. But I know it's got to be either glycine or tyrosine. So I bet you didn't realize that a second ago. In fact, I forgot about it a second ago too. So notice these problems are puzzles. These problems are puzzles. You're given a bunch of clues and you have to use the clues to puzzle things out. So we actually knew a little bit more from this than you might have thought. Um, when the chemist sees this fragment, the chemist might say, well, wait, I thought trypsin cleaves after arginine and lysine. How could there be a fragment that doesn't have any arginine or lysine in it? Well, if they think about it more clearly, they can see if there's a fragment that doesn't have any arginine or lysine in it, that fragment must have been at the C terminus, at the end of the peptide. Um, so now we're starting to see one little clue that you might not have realized that we can use with these types of proteolytic uh, enzymes. All right, so that's a, a good thing to put in your notes about trypsin. Uh, what should we write down about trypsin? What is it? Uh, what do you know about a fragment? If you use trypsin and you get a fragment that doesn't have arginine or lysine, what do you know about that fragment? The fragment goes at the end of the bipeptide chain. Yeah, so maybe I'll write that here. That's about the best we can do here. There's not much more that we can figure out here, I don't think, but we can say... C terminus, C terminus. Okay. Okay, does that make any sense? Yes. All right, that's about as much time as we'll have uh, for today. Um, do you have your textbook with you? Yes. Take a look at page 85. Okay. So, um, according to that table, where does trypsin cleave? Carboxyl side of the lysine and arginine residues. Is that consistent with what we said here? Yes. Do you see how carboxyl side means after? Mm -hmm. Because remember, we write the carboxy end on the right and the end terminus on the left. So when they say the carboxy side, they just mean after, if you write it from end terminus to C terminus. So notice trypsin is just one of many different proteolytic enzymes. There's many enzymes there. Um, so uh, some biochemistry courses would require you to memorize the cleavage sites for some of those enzymes. Other biochemistry courses would just give you that information on the test. Um, have you had a chance to ask your instructor? Has your instructor told you whether you need to have any of those memorized for the test or not? For what? For the test. Uh, so do you see... In order to, to, to use these to solve problems, you need to know where each of these enzymes cleaves. Some biochemistry classes would require you to have some of those enzymes, the cleavage sites, memorized. Other biochemistry classes, they would give you that information on the test. So um, do, do, you know which, do you know whether your instructor expects you to have those sites memorized or whether they would be given to you? No, I think she wants us to know where the sites are. You mean memorized? Yeah. All right. Probably they don't expect you to have all of them, right? That's a bunch. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, I don't think some of those are kind of rare enzymes. So um, you should ask your instructor specifically which, if any, 
which if any material from table 5.3 are you expected to have memorized. Um, some of the problems, some of the problems that you sent me actually give you the information. So you might not need, to, you, it's possible you might not need to memorize any of them. It's possible your instructor might be intending to give you that information. I doubt they expect you to have all 10 of them memorized. So I guess it's the end of the week, uh, but I, I would shoot your instructor an email, send them an email and ask which, if any, of the cleavage sites you, you're expected to have memorized or whether you would just be given that information on the test. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so that would be a good thing if you could do before our next session. Obviously, we don't want to do unnecessary memorization because we've got plenty of other stuff to work on. So um, I'm going to send you some homework problems again. I know there's only one day between now and tomorrow, but I hope that you'll find the time to do those problems carefully. Uh, I'm going to be you know, giving you the types of problems that I think are good preparation for the exam. So try to finish that uh, assignment thoughtfully. And also try to carefully review your tutoring notes from today and previously. So we started going over these protein sequencing. Protein sequencing problems are very challenging. So it's important that you uh, really make sure you have down what we talked about here today. So make sure you understand what we talked about, about sequence and composition, dancel chloride. Uh, we only did one example with trypsin, but make sure you understand the trypsin example that we talked about. Like I said, uh, make sure that you uh, email your instructor to find out whether you're expected to have any of the cleavage sites memorized for enzymes. I doubt you're expected to have all of them memorized. You might not have to know any of them. They might be given to you on the test. So you should send them an email um, about that.